San Francisco to Tel Aviv, non-stop flight, 14 hours, crossing 10 time zones. As you can imagine, when we arrived in Israel, a little bit exhausted, but we were so excited to be there. We just flew halfway across the world to be here and to have this experience with each other. We were all excited. Going to Israel with the JCC, I can't imagine a better way to be introduced to Israel. Joe and Ariel and Rachel have been preparing us as well as the folks at the JCCA. It was really great to see Ariel and Sarah and our guide Sharon, who we hadn't met yet. It was such a warm welcome. We first come together and we're from different departments, in fact, different JCCs, and we, we are looking at each other thinking, we are going to go on this adventure together and we barely know each other. That first night when we were at our hotel, it was a chance to look at everyone who was in my cohort. I wasn't even exactly sure what a cohort was. Turns out it's just the group of us that are traveling together, and that turned out to be one of the best parts of the trip. We've talked about this for so long, and now we're doing this. It was an incredible feeling. The adventure is about to begin. It was really striking to visit Masada. One of the things that was surprising to me was, first off, how desert-like Israel is, especially the Negev. Climbing the mountain during that hot part of the day was pretty intense. It was pretty, you know, but all you could see is like heat waves. The story of Masada itself, the idea that there were hundreds of Romans at the base of this mountain, and you look out at the desert, and it's interesting to think all those stories come up. A group of Jews wandering that desert, basically, for 40 years. There's a historical significance to the top of the mountain, but also Joseph had brought his shofar with him, and he played the shofar at the top of the mountain against the echo wall, and we can hear the sounds coming back. It was pretty cool. I'd fallen way behind. It was me and Jason in the back, and I was actually starting to get a little worried about the both of us because we had both gone through all of our water. Then out of nowhere, Tony and Tiffany come round in the corner, back in our direction, you know, hung out with us, offered us their water, and helped us on the rest of the trip. And so quite literally, I started on that trip all by myself in the back, and I finished it out with the group. So Rachel Korazim, who spoke before we went to the Holocaust Museum, did a fantastic lecture. She was framing and contextualizing why the Holocaust Museum had changed. How is Yad Vashem an Israeli Holocaust Museum? Or let's do a professional word, how it relates to the Israeli narrative of the Holocaust. And I thought that was an incredibly fascinating context for understanding how the Israeli society has shifted from 50 years ago to the generation that it is now. Yad Vashem is an incredible museum, but it's relentless. It snakes you through all these different rooms. You don't really have a choice of which way you want to go. Pretty much like the people involved in the, in the Holocaust had no choice where they were sent. From the time you walk into that, by the time you get out, it's just intense all the way through. Being brought up Jewish and growing up in a Jewish home, I've been taught about the Holocaust my entire life, as long as I've been taught about anything. When both my children were born, when I held them for the first time, and I promised them that I would protect them, that I would be there for them. I would always do everything in my power to keep them safe. And one of the most powerful feelings for me was how horrible it would feel to not be able to keep that promise. I managed to hold it together till the very end, but then there's all this empty space of people who have not yet been identified and their families still don't know what happened to them. It was a, it was a long it was a long day. And then we got thrown into the craziness so that was the show right after and you kind of had to shake it off right because you go from something horrible and into the heart of Israeli culture. So it was a juxtaposition that was needed. Everybody asked me what was what was the place that was most meaningful for you, and I was like, well, yeah, it was Jerusalem. Ah, oh, Jerusalem was so beautiful. The old city was by far my favorite. The rest of Jerusalem looked like 
a city. I like, you couldn't really tell it from another city, I thought, but like going to the old city was magical. The saying about the air being thicker over Jerusalem because of all the prayers was like really beautiful and saturated with meaning. It was really special to me to be in the Holy Sepulcher and I held the rosary that my grandmother gave me at my confirmation and thought about my family and thought about how proud they are for me to go on this journey. It was, it was just really meaningful. So I had prayers from different people and prayers of my own that I went to put in the wall. I was able to put the children's wishes into the wall and I had 17 wishes in hand. To be somewhere that is so ingrained in the culture and the history of your family, my family, just the emotion of being where generations of people from my background have either been or have always talked about being. But the weekdays are for the sake of Shabbat. It is not an interlude, but it is the climax of living. The most important thing that I learned from Shabbat was the idea of unplug. This idea of 24-6. We live in a time where with our cell phones and our email, all that stuff. How do I learn to turn that off? You know, turn my phone off and have moments of reflection on Fridays and be more present. The dinner with the Lesters was really inspirational for me because I had never attended a Shabbat dinner in someone's home before and the way that they made it so meaningful and how they bless their children at night and how they light candles, not only the two Shabbat candles, but they light candles for all the people that they want to remember. It was such a great moment, I think, for all of us in our group too. I think it helped us to feel really connected and share all of our meaningful moments. Get off the bus. Start rushing in, rushing in, and then there's tables set up. There's uh, like tomatoes on one table. There's dough on the other table. I was like, yes, we get to cook. Today's my day. The dinner with the Drews, that was really special. My brother's a chef and I love cooking. My main part, I was looking at each station. I was like, which one do I want to do? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a little bit of everything. So when somebody eats that, I'd be like, I help make that too. And then eating it at the end was just amazing because we sat down and we're like, yeah, is that the one I made? I want to eat that. Let's try this one, you know? That was a good time. That was one of my favorite evenings ever. Sitting down and eating family meals don't happen too often. And I've had more in Israel, I think, in that trip than I did the whole year. I thought it was so great that we cooked together and then we sat in a large table and we ate together and for these people to welcome us into their home, that was so special. Everybody wanted to stay and hang out. It was like one of those where you say goodbye and it takes you about an hour to leave. Good night, good food, good family. One of the instances that struck me was the tour that we took with Yeramim, which was a bus tour through both Israeli and Muslim settlements. Just sort of seeing the stark differences between these fairly new Israeli settlements and then these very poverty-stricken Arab villages and just seeing them right up against each other and then seeing these walls and seeing the highway with a big wall surrounding the highway so that people driving on the highway wouldn't get shot. I mean, it was fairly evident, you know, like how unequal these two groups were being treated. And then in addition to that, seeing like how close they are together. You know, they're, they're across the street from each other in some instances. They're doing so much work to have Israeli and Arab children interconnect with one another, how they're trying to integrate both cultures and, and stop the stigma. You know, not shying away from the conflict just because it's complicated, but actually embracing those complications. As we all got back into the bus and, and drove away, there was, that, there was a little boy who was standing right at a, at a corner of a fence, and he was standing there just looking at us. But that had an impact on me because there was a person who, you know, we view it as a, a learning experience, and that's that was his life.
Cohort 10 marks a decade of the JCCSF committing to sending staff members every year to really figure out what Israel is all about. It was so much in so little time, and everything that we did was a learning for me because I came in like blind. There was like a great quote I picked up. People who don't read newspapers are uninformed. People who read newspapers are misinformed. Just getting to go there and getting the education that I was craving about it in a very hands-on and direct way was priceless. So it wasn't so much of like me having one opinion and it changing. It was like, oh, now I have enough information to have an opinion. I am so grateful that I got to go. The people who planned our trip were so smart. You know, when we biked through the park and we biked along the ocean and we saw the surfers, I appreciate the thought that went into alternating the very serious experiences with a little bit of relief, a little bit of fun. I definitely feel much more connected to the people on the trip. It reinforces the community-ness of this community center. It makes me smile. I was thankful for the entire experience. I think my knowledge was very surface. So, you know, things you learn in history class or from working at the J. The cultural immersion portion of it and actually being in Israel and seeing what we hear put to practice was very beneficial to me. It's very hard to even tell people about it because it's so complex and there's so many little different sides and different angles and... We didn't just hear about Israel. We didn't just read about Israel. We breathed the air of Israel. We walked on the soil of Israel. And you have to really know a little bit about all of that to kind of get the big picture. And I truly believe this is the only way you can do it.